Hi everybody. Thanks for joining us here for this awesome behind the scenes kind of look at the inner workings of the Marine Life Center in Bellingham, Washington. We've got um, our own personal tour guide here. This is Casey. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about where we are right now. So you are in the Port of Bellingham, Washington, uh, which is a little further north than Seattle. Uh, we're kind of Bellingham's best kept secret. We don't do a whole lot of advertising because we're a very small space and we cater to a lot of people uh, here in the community. We host a lot of classes and we have a lot of regulars that like to come down and grow with us. Um, so you're looking at about 1,200 gallons of seawater up top here, not including our system downstairs where our, the filtration and magic happens. Uh, and this is all local sea life from the San Juan Islands and the inner tidal area of Bellingham, all of our local beaches. So we're looking at like um, rocky shores, we're looking at mudflats, and we're looking at eelgrass bed animals all combined into their own unique habitat systems uh, here in this one small space. And it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of learning and, uh, and um, experiences that happen right here for the kids and for, for everyone. And we are super excited. Uh, we got here a little, a little bit ago and we're already geeking out about all the amazing animals that there are to see and to touch and to learn about. Um, and now it's feeding time. So tell us what's on the menu uh, for this tank here. Sure. So we've got mostly local food here aside from the mice's shrimp. Uh, so we have uh, Oregon shrimp meat. We have some scallops underneath there. We've got local spot shrimp. Uh, some of you might call them spot prawns. And then we have uh, the Japanese um, manila clam. And um, there is a local version of those that live here as well. They look very, very similar. And so the animals that are used to eating some of these foods in the wild can get something similar to what they would like to eat. Um, they also get um, other foods depending on the day of the week. We like to chop up um, local seaweed for those that eat um, both seaweed and meat um, and offer a wide variety of fresh and local foods. Awesome. Um, and then we have a lot of plankton and whatnot that you're not seeing today as well. We do grow things hmm. like rotifers in the back for, for those animals that do um, suspension feed and whatnot. Awesome. All right. Well, um, so we're looking at our rocky habitat, right? This is something that would be really similar to the rocky shores of the, the San Juan Islands. Um, so we've got some really big anemone species. There's a lot of fish. I'm looking at I see some rockfish. I see some Irish sword, scorpion fish. Um, there's a, a cabazon or two in there. Some really, really cool species, and I'm sure they're they're ready for food. Oh yeah, look at this. I don't know if you guys can see with the glare, but there is a cabazon who's just right up here. So some of these fish have grown up with us and are used to being hand fed. Uh, some of these are wild animals and um, have only been here a short time, and you can kind of tell based on how they feed or how they expect to be fed, um, what they're used to feeding and where they might have come from. Um, so the, a lot of these rockfish were brought to us um, at about 11 years old, I think it was last year, from the NOAA fisheries, um, and they were uh, reared from a wild rockfish in a public <laughs> aquarium, um, and for the first time they were really successful in rearing um, baby rockfish, which are born live by, I believe, the hundreds of thousands and are very difficult to raise. So this was the first uh, big successful batch of rockfish that they were able to rear. And uh, there's brown rockfish, there was china rockfish and tiger rockfish and other species. Um, but we're looking at the browns and one tiger named Tigger down here, you can see uh, the along with this cabazon, tiger. who is a wild fish. Yeah, this, this cabazon has figured out the, um, the begging. <laughs> So there's a female as well. This is a uh, one of two, and uh, Cabazon display something called sexual dimorphism, where uh, within the species you can tell the difference of the male or the female based on either color, uh, fin shape, size, uh, something of the sort. And within Cabazon, the males are usually brown, red, and the females are usually green. Um, so this is a smaller male, and then our larger female is somewhere hiding, uh, likely She's from the camera. Sneaky. She's a bit shy. Sneaky. We've got a lot of bottom dwellers in this tank, so that's a really effective uh, strategy, being really energy conserving. And they'll sit on the bottom until a tasty morsel comes by and wait and sort of blend in with the rocks. Just like this buffalo sculpin down center past what is an expired uh, or already hatched um, big skate egg case, also known as a mermaid's purse. Uh, if you're not familiar with a skate, it's a lot like a stingray, um, a, uh, but it has no barb like a stingray. And these uh, species up here get eight feet for the bigs uh, and about five feet for the long nose. 
<laughs> and so I can tell just by the size and shape of this egg case or mermaid's purse that this came from a big skate. And if I remember right, there were seven babies. Um, I call them little burritos when they <laughs> hatch out. And they all curl up inside that little communal egg case before they hatch out. So fantastic. We um, were actually able to find a mermaid's purse out at Fox Island during one of our nighttime beach walks a couple years ago. And it was so exciting because you could feel the little babies wiggling in the inside the case. Goodness. Well, we don't have any live big skate uh, cases this year. Uh, they come as bycatch for the local fishermen. So the fishermen come in with maybe crabs or shrimp and they don't realize that one of them was holding on to one of these egg cases. And once they're in the port, they can't just dump them overboard. They wouldn't survive. So they bring them to us and we can hatch out and either choose to get a permit to release them or gift them to other aquariums or keep them. Um, but we have a smaller space so we prefer to hand them out. Um, and we do have live long nose skate egg cases in, Ooh, in, the uh, tall tank in, a, in another tank over here. We can show you when we get there. Nice. Um, what I love to do is to candle them for the students and actually uh, find a dark space, a dark corner within the aquarium, sometimes in a bubble, and then we hand them a flashlight and you can look through and see the babies rolling around inside and you can see the yolk um, kind of like a chicken that is attached to them, which is what they uh, use for nutrition until they hatch out. Uh, once they've used up their yolk, they only have a couple of days before they need to be out of their uh, their case and we found that some of them are not able to make it out on their own so we perform what we call a little cesarean on the <laughs> case and actually help the babies hatch out which is fun for the communities to see we tried to do that on video for everybody oh that's awesome yeah so it's about time for us to check on those we'll have to check on them soon uh, this sea star up here, this is a giant pink star. So this one's closely related to uh, the ochre star. So it's uh, Pisaster brevispinus instead of Pisaster ochraceus. Oh my gracious. Um, <laughs> so this one is folding back, tasting the oils of the food floating on the surface and is looking for uh, the food. So I'm handing it what it might like in the wild, which is a, a clam. And I've opened it up, although the star could do the work itself. If you're not familiar with sea star anatomy, Sea stars have what is called a water vascular system, and they use a little hole on the top of their body, it's called a <laughs> madrepore, to pump in the seawater that moves their feet and the rest of their body. Um, it's a lot like, the seawater is a lot like their blood in their body. And so what, what they do to get the clamshell open when the clam is alive and not frozen, is um, they grab with their two feet and pull, 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 and the clam uh, has muscles like us. They need nutrition, they need rest, um, and they get tired. And so the, the, the sea stars always win because they always have the power of the water to continuously pull until that clam just can't possibly hold its shell shut anymore. And then the meaty morsels inside is what the sea star is after. So they push their stomach outside of their body. They have two stomachs, one of which can come outside and envelope the meat and then kind of release some enzymes to help turn it into a meat milkshake and then drink it back into its, mm, I want to say clam milkshake. Stomach. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. So here we are, and the sea star is oh. really hungry. And I'm noticing that all the smells in the water are bringing out this cool scavenger over here. There oh is my. a big. So this is BB King, <laughs> live Dungeness crab right now. And we call them that because he had a big barnacle attached to his back, but he's molted his exoskeleton and grown a new shell and no longer has that barnacle attached because when they shed, uh, anything that was on their shell goes away with that shell. So he's got a fresh, shiny new shell and I bet he would love a plant as I well. I bet he would. He's, he's out there going, hey, what about me? Meanwhile, our Cabazon friend's coming over to say hello again, too. Well, <laughs> everybody's excited about lunch. One of my favorite fun facts about crabs is if you look at the way they move, often when they smell food or they're going for their food, they move backwards or sideways to get their food and not forward because they don't usually use their eyes to hunt. They use a sense of smell located somewhere um, around their knees often because it's the furthest <laughs> thing from their body. And if Wait, I forget, sense? the name is called chemoreceptors, a lot like what uh, octopuses use as well in their, uh, in their suckers. Um, so you can you saw that he moved backwards right on top of that clam, knew right where it was, um, just on its... Yeah, surface. even though the, the eyes are very much on the top of their head, so they definitely can't see beneath themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so having an, an evolutionary strategy to be able to find find food when you can't see it, it totally makes sense. And speaking of Dungeness crabs, I don't know if you've been on the water lately, but now is the time that uh, Dungeness... Uh, plankton larvae are out in abundance and they're becoming um, no longer their smaller form. They're coming, um, I forget how you say it, megalopes? Yeah. Megalopa? Yeah. Yeah, they're becoming this form that is at the surface but quite large, almost as big as your thumbnail. And what sticks out to me the most is they gather in these large freeways along our docks here to, to feed on other plankton. 
and they have these beautiful big blue baby blue eyes and they're just really easy to pick oh, out oh they're so cute the area. i love it yeah he's going right to town on that clam that is a happy that's a ha right happy crabby we have another We've got, a, we've got another eater. happy clam eater. The clam is not so happy, but the uh, the star definitely is. You can see those two feet totally prying that apart to get into the inside. And this sea star is what's known as a false ochre or mottled star of Asterius trichelli. And this is one of the larger species of stars and more colorful, colorful species that you'll see here. Uh, if you look out, so this one's very much an orange, beautiful color. We have species that are green, uh, greenish brown, blue, uh, here's a more blue one as well. Oh yeah, lots of variety. Lots of variety with the net species. I love so my those. favorite things about them. Those models. Very hardy, super intertidal. Um, very good at finding their way throughout some of the roughest conditions to find food. I like the redheaded ones myself. <laughs> Speaking of redheaded, stars, yeah, right. The leather star. Here we go. Here's another favorite of ours. Here's a tough one. So this this species doesn't have that rough exterior. Uh, like most sea stars are known for. This species is actually quite soft. It feels almost slimy. And you're seeing on the top here bits of their, um, it's like their kind of gills that stick through the sea star that help them to breathe. So if you see them out of the water, they won't look as fluffy or the same color because as they retract those uh, to protect their body, um, you'll see mostly just the gray and the small pores where... And Sina, what's your favorite thing to talk about with the surface of sea stars? Yeah. Well, I like the Not being able to breathe because if these gills were covered in barnacles or seaweed that would be a bad day for our sea star so they're covered in tiny little spines that can pick those away and i always like to put my hairy knuckles on a sea star and feel those little <laughs> pinchers grab at me are those easier to Super see on cool. species like the ochre yeah, the star and stars yeah they're really hard to see but you can feel you them can feel almost them. more than yeah, yeah. more than you can yeah. Um, urchins also do have pedicillaria too. Sina's Cena. going to try it. All right, we'll see if we can interrupt. Can it multitask? Eat a clam and pull my knuckle hairs. <laughs> Grab knuckle hairs and clams at the same time. Oh, maybe. Let me move my ring out of the way. <laughs> this is a trick that you can do. It doesn't doesn't have to be knuckle hair you can I like to do it with the hair on the back of my arm because it's a bit longer than my knuckle hair so you can really kind of see that um, and Sina in the past has even stuck her bangs to some of these sea stars to show that that feature off which is really really kind of cool thing. he's sticking kind of he's like nope I'm eating guys hey, never mind try that again later. <laughs> <laughs> I love it what a very cool adaptation right I mean secret hidden pinchers love it <laughs> um, Here's some more echinoderms, our favorites, the, the California sea cucumber, which totally does not fit the mold of being a spiny skinned animal, especially this one, which looks really spiky and spiny, but is actually about as hard as jello. Um, so they're really, really flexible little guys. Um, and then we've got the urchins and the sand dollars, which are pretty much exactly the same, just with different shaped skeletons. Um, and the sand dollar here, you can see all the little spines moving the exact same as the ones on the urchin. Um, so our urchins, we've got a purple urchin here. You can see their spines move and if they're touched, they can react to touch. And so they'll move their spines a little bit in response to me touching. Um, and people say that they're getting a nice urchin hug. I, I say that he's getting ready to wage war in case you have ill intent. Um, you can see the spines on this green sea urchin moving. Such fascinating creatures, Absolutely. different body styles. You can see it's two feet sticking yeah. out as well. So just like a sea star, urchins have suction cup toes. Yeah, um, so and so do sand dollars. But these two feet of the sea star, two yeah. feet of the urchin, and we've got two feet of the cucumber. Definitely a characteristic of all of this, these animals. And then, oh yeah, this is super cool. Tell us about this. So what we're looking at is the bottom of the urchin where the mouth is located, and they have 
five self-sharpening teeth that allow them to eat the hard algaes that are their favorite thing. Urchins aren't too picky if they need to eat meat, vegetables, they can, um, but its favorite thing to eat, at least that we found, is gonna be your hard brown kelps. Good chewers, those urchins, for sure. And it has a funny name it's called the Aristotle's Lantern. Which, who picked that name? I don't know. It kind of looks like a lantern when you I take guess. it apart. <laughs> yeah. I guess. My favorite part about the two feet of the cucumber family, or phylum, no nope, family, uh, is they kind of tell you what kind of feeding style that specific species of cucumber does. So this giant California yeah, that's cucumber a great point. has this big belly row of two feet that allow it to graze along the seafloor with its um, like feathery mops where it mops up detritus, which is a fancy word for decaying matter. Uh, so little vacuum cleaners of the sea, I call them all uh, Kirby and Hoover. <laughs> uh, but then you've, you've got your suspension feeder cucumbers, which have rows of two feet um, kind of equally Here's along different one. Oh yeah, here we go. And see, Here's there they cram themselves into to different spaces and then throw their feathery um, mouth parts into the water and actually grab particles. Oh. Uh, There's a California who's perfect. just mopping up his food. Just right it. on cue. Thanks for, for performing your job here, Thanks, friend. friend. <laughs> I love it. All right, all right. There's too many cool things to talk about. Let's let's talk about what we've got in these um, in these little tanks here because we've got some pretty interesting animals uh, that we don't typically see intertidally. So a lot of our viewers may not be familiar with this, but um, this is one of my favorite crustaceans. I would say it's my favorite crab. It's not really a crab. And I would say my favorite lobster, but it's not really a lobster. Uh, but this is called a squat lobster. And you can tell it's a little bit different from a true crab because they only have three pairs of walking legs and then two pinchers compared to the four pairs of walking legs that we see on like our Dungeness buddy who's, yeah, he's totally gone. He's like, I'm gonna eat my clam in peace. Oh yeah, he's way over there. Um, so he's got four walking legs and two pinchers. This guy's only got three. Um, so he's closer to a hermit crab. And then you can see those uh, antenna on this animal are really long. So they reach quite a distance away from them. Um, unlike a, a true crab, which has teeny tiny little antenna right at the top. I like how its pinchers are like multiple <laughs> times the length of its body even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, definitely an animal that's like a, maybe don't touch it. <laughs> it's hard to tell, but you, it's got a tail that really helps yeah. eject it out of a bad scenario. Because um, so a lot of things like to eat this animal, just like a shrimp in the ocean. They're um, swimmable. They're yeah. very good at getting away. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But sorry, there, dude. There you have it. He's like, hey, don't you see my giant pinchers? Aren't you scared of me? And as we see these a lot, scuba diving. So Sunrise Beach Park in the Key Peninsula area. Um, has this nice clay wall where pitic clams have burrowed Ooh. and you see lots of squat lobsters living in the uh, abandoned pitic clam holes and they'll just kind of hide out and stick those big pinchers out and wave at you as you dive along. Well, I don't usually talk about the edibility of our animals. I like to point out that most people have heard of a squat lobster, but it goes by a different name when you eat it. Um, I was at the store the other day in the freezer section, and lo and behold, a bag of langostinos. Oh, there which you go. Which is one other name. Look at for your a squat delicious uh, langostino here. We won't eat you, friend. We will. We will like feed you. You eat it like a like a crawfish or a crayfish oh, or a crawdad, yeah. however you say it. Yeah. Everybody says it a different way. Um, so fascinating. Uh, what did the squat lobsters usually get fed? So they're scavengers. Um, they easily um, devour bits of shrimp, mm. uh, which seems a little, I don't know. It's almost a it's, shrimp eating a shrimp. I mean, um, crustaceans eat crustaceans. Like it? It's fine. Mammals eat mammals. I like steak, so there you go. same kind of deal. I have yet to see it eat any sea vegetation. I don't know for a fact if it would take any down. Uh, when we offer it their combo cubes, which are a compilation of mm -hmm. different uh, sea vegetables. They'll eat meats, it all. They, pick, yeah. Yeah, they can kind of pick at the whole thing. They like I like them. They're so cool. I just noticed that on the sea star, this leather star we were just looking at, there are small animals. I believe oh, yeah. to be larval worms, maybe from the commensal worm. They, I'm not sure. They almost look like pyramids, snails, but hard to say without a microscope. Interesting. Oh. Um, speaking of, can you flip that sea star over? Earlier we were noticed carefully. Um, he may be very stuck right now. Um, we were noticing a commensal animal, an animal that has a relationship with the sea star, um, a symbiotic relationship. The sea star is pretty much unaffected, um, but the worm gets a, a handy place to live without any interference from predators or things like that. And they get a mode of transportation too. 
Um, and they probably also do partake in a little bit of the eating since sea stars digestive system is largely outside of their body when they're eating. Um, it gives the worm an opportunity to grab some food. Let's see if I can, there. Really there. No, I've got a great it. view right there. And you can see this worm has got these little scales on its surface and it's really blending in well. There we go, it's gonna move a little. This is a polychaete worm, so one of those segmented marine worms. Yesterday was International Polychaete Day, so um, happy day, a little bit late, my friend. Such a cool little creature. Um, scale worms are really uh, primarily commensal. We see lots of them. They'll live with limpets and things like that, and in some of those situations, they actually can repel predators. So in keyhole limpets, um, we've actually seen them come out and defend and attack the tube feet of a sea star that may be um, getting a little too close. I also like how they blend in with whoever, yeah, whoever they're yeah, on. I've seen some on the California sea cucumbers that are a dark red color. It's mm, kind of interesting that they match so closely up there. So yeah. fascinating. I feel like what I see there is possibly the animal having to take little tiny nibbles yeah. of the color around them to get that matching color, at least with the reds I noticed. We have uh, in our intertidal zone here, commonly with the spaghetti worms, the robust oh, yeah. and uh, other intertidal spaghetti worms, um, a scale worm that is very dark in color but very beautiful and almost like a rainbow in the right light. Oh, so pretty. I it, but they're very common over uh, one, of our, one of our local beaches. I love it. So um, in this little container, we've got uh, some a good variety of hermit crabs, as well as the snails that make the shells that the hermit crabs ultimately occupy. So the hermit crabs don't make their own shell, they have to find one. So that's a good reason to leave shells on the beach. Um, even if they're broken, they can still become uh, a home for those snails or excuse me, for those hermit crabs. And um, this is one of the larger species of hermit crabs that needs a really big shell to move into. Um, so ultimately they'll be moving into these uh, tritons or uh, moon snail shells as their kind of final home. And there's not a lot of in-between shells between the smaller like dogwinkles and periwinkle snails. And then you have these really big ones. So they have to hope that they come across a, a snail shell that's not quite done growing or is really big for its size, depending on the species. And I mentioned that the hermit crab and the squat lobster are kind of related and you can kind of see that when you look at the big long antennas on this one, able to reach out to the ends of their shell so they can really kind of feel behind them. And then using that sensory perception that we mentioned with the Dungeness crab, they're able to really um, navigate well. And Stina, would you, lift him up for me so that we can see how that larger right hand shell our uh, right hand pincher can close up their their shell so if i were to uh, try to attack him and, and come after him i mean he's a touch tank animal so he's probably pretty used to it but notice how that shell just fits right in there and can almost close the door that's also their first weapon and line of defense so if i were really going to go after him that would be um how I would try to right. try to I'd capture agree, him, yeah. and then that that pincher is going to grab me. So here's another one. So we found that uh, in this species, this is a wide-handed, uh, used to be called thin-handed, Elasochiris tenuomanus. They prefer the moon snail shell, um, as this is their niche. They fit best um, this their front claw for a trapdoor oh, yeah, for this that. shell. So the Oregon triton shell is a little less of a fit. Um, Hermit crabs choose a shell based on whatever fits their body type, and normally it's based on the shape of their tail, because not mm -hmm. all hermit crab tails are the same. There's variation not only within um, different species, but within each species. And I was gonna say, if you let him feel like he's gonna try to flip over, we can see the back half of his body a little bit. He's a little shy. Um, you can see the back half of his body, so that they, and then they, they have these little teeny tiny legs back there. Um, those kind of help keep the inside of their shell clean. They Such also cool are where creature. they attach their eggs, yeah, which is if it's, amazing. If it's a female, they'll have their little eggs dangling. Normally a crab would put their eggs under their abdomen, um, but the abdomen of the hermit crab is coiled up in that shell, right? So they need to come up with a better, a better, <laughs> better plan. <laughs> so great. So here's that snail um, that the hermit crab uses the shell from. Now the snails don't like outgrow them they don't molt they don't shed them they grow with the animal the whole time they're a part of them and so um for the hermit crab to be able to to make his home in there the snail's got to be dead uh, so some hermit crabs will 
actually kill a snail if they can, um, but these snails are really tough. They've got this huge muscular foot here, and then at the back of the foot, they have what's called an operculum, and that's like a custom-made trap door that seals them inside. So they're pretty tough. Love that you can see the antennas and little eyes. Aren't they great? On this one. They're amazing. Oh, I love species. them. I want to say that this is one of the more common species I see bioluminescing uh, oh. during July and August here. So they, for whatever reason, the snail. Yeah, well, it's not the animal itself. It's just covered in the noctiluca. Oh, like, they, just, they just manage to rummage through it the most. Oh, it probably gets that. stuck in all those bristles. So, so cool. Operculum is one of my favorite sites. Oh, it's great. Um, so Vicky's asking, why did hermit crabs need shells? Um, and if you look at our squat lobster, this is um, a good kind of in between between a hermit crab and, um, and a true crab. So rather than being kind of shortened um, front to back, these guys are uh, more elongated, almost lobster-like, hence the, the name rock lobster. And their abdomens are really soft. Um, don't think he'll let me hold him up to show you that. <laughs> He's like, uh, excuse me, no. So you can see the little tail folded under on this one. Um, and hermit crab's tail is really muscular. Um, yeah, if we can look. The intertidal species will often let yeah, you get a they, little more curious. Yeah. But if you peek inside there, the tail of this crab starts kind of where you can no longer see, and it's shaped just like your pinky, uh, depending told, on the That's species. exactly how I describe it. It just kind of hooks into that shell um, with their little abdomen. Such a cool group of animals. They're so fascinating. And there are many, many species of hermit crabs um, so here's another one, a little bit smaller species here. Um, and the colors are a little off in here because we're in um, a green tented area. You might notice our complexions look a little, seen as looking a little blue over there. Um, and that's just the reflection. So some of these animals look a little bit different than they would in nature, of course. The hairy hermit, that's the one moving super fast. You can always tell because they have that little white joint on them. Super great. Ooh, our sea star is totally chowing down on that muscle. The hairy hermit's one of my most favorite of the intertidal species. Yeah. As you'll notice, instead of choosing to hide inside the shell, <laughs> they pick a shell that's either too tiny for them, um, too high inside so they can run with it, or one that they will drop and then run with And then shell run fast. Inside. Crazy. I always say that they're the, the Ferrari drivers yeah. compared to the, the motorhome. So this is one who's chosen a motorhome. It's a big, thick <laughs> shell. It's got more than enough space for everything he needs um, versus the hairy hermit who's like, no, nah, let's be fast. Um, all right. So we're going to focus on these cool, cool fish over here. Um, these are the rye mouths um, and they look a bit like eels, but of course Puget Sound, um, the Salish Sea doesn't have any true eels. It's just too cold for true eels. Um, but we do have some very eel-like fish who have taken on that role in their environment of being very snake-like and elongated. Um, and these are rye mouths. Let's see if I can come over here and get an even, even closer view of them. Normally, I like to Hungry use scientific friends. names to differentiate new animals. However, <laughs> the common name of this fish, other than rye mouth, is also potato head, which is just fun to say. And they do kind of have that potato-shaped face, which is the only part of the animal you would normally see if you were diving and happened to come across these. Um, they usually they don't have themselves. good aim. They really don't. I, I think that their eyesight might not be perfect, uh, just based on where they're from. But they, they dig themselves a burrow in the mud, and then mostly... Uh, it's their head that comes out to uh, chomp after a bite to eat, and then they put themselves right back in that hole. Oh, buddy, you got to try harder. There you go. <laughs> I think you got it. No, <laughs> Still, it. Oh, friend. Oh. If you didn't live in an aquarium, how would you survive? You're so spoiled. Oh, these are such cool fish. They look a lot like a whale. Are you kidding me? My nice little starry flounder here. You have <laughs> bitten off more than you can chew. Yes. <laughs> oh, the flounders are so interesting because of how they start their lives. They're a normal fish when they hatch from an egg. They've got a top and a left and a right and all the normal things. They're totally see-through, so you can see their insides. You can see their heart beating. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? They're coming. Yeah, Eli. Yeah, Eli. You gonna help me? Yeah. So you can sprinkle some around. What do you think, Evelyn? 
Oh my gosh, these fish are so funny. They're so excited. All right, where'd my flounder go? There he is. Um, so they, after a short period of time, they begin to lean to the left or to the right. And in North American flounders, it's almost always to the left, the Pleuronectiidae family. Um, but in starry flounders, they, they have a few more of them that go, go right. So cool. And they're able to, um, they, they almost swim like a magic carpet and they can land right on the sand. Um, and you can see the back half of his body right here is covered in sand. That's a really great camouflage strategy. And then only their eyeballs and their mouth are hanging out. And they're ambush predators for the most part. They like to sit and wait um, for, <laughs> for friends. Oh, there's a greenling. There's a little greenling over here. Oh, and a little crabby friend coming out going, where's mine? The, the beauties of a community <laughs> tank is all the interrelationships um, that are here. Oh, my friend Peach is tuning in, and we've got Julie and Mary watching too. We love, we love seeing all these fans tuning in. Oh, look at you. <laughs> you are a ridiculous animal, and I love you for it. A for effort. Yeah, for good try, effort. friend. Good try. They love their shrimp. They do. A potato, head? A potato head or a rye mouth? All right, and everybody loves to feed, so luckily we've got some really handy helpers here. Good job. And they just like sucked it in. So um, the, one, of the, one of the things that we're seeing is this is definitely a no touch tank because the rockfish that are in here are, um, they're venomous. They have spines. Oh, look at your big mouth. Venomous spines. They have big venomous spines that are uh, quite a bit dangerous, so we don't want to mess with them. But luckily, <laughs> he's like, the food is so close to me. Trying. He'll get. He'll get it. He'll. He's gonna Hoover that up off the bottom in a minute. So great. All right. If anybody's got any questions, now's a great time to pop those in the comments, um, and we can we can try to answer those for you while we've got the experts here. Our smaller fish are seeing the action happening here, and they're anticipating their snack coming so uh, in this tank we've got here's a great view of that snail's foot right there apologize for the glare it's quite bright out today um so these critters are just kind of hanging i think i can get a good view this direction so in here we've got some uh lined perch some little ones and then some quite large ones and they're going after this mysa shrimp here which is a krill species uh, that's really high in nutrients and fat. So they're always a favorite of aquarium animals. They really, really like eating these nice big mice. So cool. <laughs> the, there's a very hungry hermit crab here going, where's mine? So these striped perch are a live bearer, a lot like the shiner perch, where they're actually not related to, which we'll uh, look at here in a minute. Uh, but see. these striped perch are very mature, although they're still growing, and the smaller ones in the tank, I think we have four in here, um, are last spring's um, live births. So wow. They're quite uh, fully, fully formed, ready to be on their own if they need to, but they usually end up schooling with um, their parents uh, who are schooling with all their siblings and possibly their parents. Um, so you see large uh, shoals or schools of these fish um, and around pilings. Um, they will split up to go find um, food when food is scarce, but often end up uh, coming back together and um, schooling with other fish like the shiner perch uh, or stickleback. In yeah, our settings here in the strength in numbers. Um, so Julianne asks, how many species do you have? And I think we asked you earlier um, and we <laughs> determined a lot. Uh, we would safely say hundreds of species, especially when you consider all the little teeny tiny things that are, are growing in the tanks, things that come in in the water um, that we didn't even plan to have. Even for the amount of animals that we have here, it's just a small percentage of what we do have here in the Puget Sound. We are so lucky uh, where we're located. Uh, we get the upwelling from Alaska, those cold mineral rich waters that allow for uh, microplankton. So, um, tiny plants and tiny animals which feed the larger animals and the, the the species numbers that we have here are just just higher than just about i think so much else diversity yeah yeah amazing so the, those silver fish there are the the shiner perch yeah, these that are guys. Um, towards the surface and so those are also light bears and those are 
or mature sized fish as well. Their babies come out about the size of a, a nickel, yeah. um, about as flat as a pancake though, and then they and they start to eat and bulk up. And that, yeah, and, and we actually ready to, to breed upon. We just birth. caught we just caught some uh, during our scene uh, with our community science project uh, last week. Um, so I think we've got a great picture on our Instagram of a, a, a newborn uh, next to a fully grown adult. They're just so amazing to see. Also in here, you might notice more of those eel-like creatures. These are gunnels. There's, I've, I've come, the longer you stare at this tank, so the more gunnels you find. Um, there are, there are many in here and they're quite personable fish. They, they beg, they see you and they're like, oh, hey, look at this guy. He's coming over like, where's my snack? I don't know how long you keep your gunnels at your facility, but if they're here long term, we're able to train them to yeah. come and fill up around our fingers and bag yes. them like a small dog. Yes, they're so, they're so great. Um, and this is a really cool tank. I'll stand back so you can get the full kind of effect of it. Um, but there is a dome in the center, which is awesome. And we can see Stina. Oh, there you are, Stina. <laughs> Stuck in the middle of a school of fish. You seem right at home. Um, Back here, I wanna talk about one of my most favorite fish in the Puget Sound. This is called a sailfin sculpin. Um, lots and lots of sculpin species out here, but um, the sailfin is really interesting. Males get this really big sailfin on there and they can communicate with one another. They signal. Um, they're just really, really pretty and mesmerizing. You could just stare at that undulating dorsal fin over and over and over and over again. So great. Um, we've got some juvenile rockfish in here. Look how cute you are, dude. And a very teenager wolfie who's yeah. out for Oh, look at you, little wolfie. Big wolfie, medium wolfie. Oh, you're darling. Okay, the glare. We've dubbed her Saline Dion. <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh, my word. Can you see a little better from up above? Because the yeah, glare yeah, is awful here. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna come on. Oh yeah, Hi, look sweet. at that. Look at Hi. you. Oh, you're magical. Hi, friend. She would like me to shell the pearl and earth shrimp tail. Yes. However, I think she's hungry enough today. She'll take it. That's so great. So uh, again, wolf eel's not a true eel. Um, and you, the dead giveaway that it's not a true eel is those big pectoral fins. Mm -hmm. So all of these eel-like animals that we have here uh, in these tanks, the gunnels, the rye mouth, the uh, wolf eel, they all have big, big pectoral fins. Oh, here's our little six rayed star. Ooh, this is yeah. one of the few species um, that you see commonly in the intertidal zone that has more than five arms. Pretty interesting. We love to talk about pentaradial symmetry, but this one kind of breaks the mold. <laughs> there. And from above, you can really tell uh, which one of these shiner perch are, are females and who are probably preggers. There's a couple that are looking a little swollen. This guy right there. Yeah, definitely. And which ones are males too, because they, they turn and they're almost they black. Get, and yeah, color. they get that really different coloration so great and then the rockfish check them out just doing what they do they're looking like a rock don't don't worry about me they have really sophisticated swim bladders so they can just sit in one spot um, while these faster <laughs> perch just come on in and swarm them then we got a few more of those oh hey there hey there little green uh, a few more of the sculpin in this tank Check out the camouflage on these yeah. decorator crabs. One, what two, decorator three, crabs? four, five, <laughs> six, maybe seven or eight. Jeez, Casey, clean your tank. There's too much algae. Oh wait, those are crabs. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Amazing! These are such cool creatures. They've got these um, carapace that's almost covered with Velcro hooks. Um, and so, hey, now Please that's not a me. snack. <laughs> He's like, oh, I finally see the crab. Uh, no, you're beautiful. Look at you. Um, and what I find most fascinating about these decorator crabs is when they do molt, um, when they have to shed their skin in order to grow, all the stuff that they've collected over the previous months has to be transplanted to their new shell. So they'll, quite often you'll see them just sitting there. So awesome. Oh, hi, Sarah is tuning in. Uh, Julian asks, what's the largest animal that you have? Oh, well, uh, as per, per weight, I would probably say our cabazon as they get up to 25 pounds. And I know that our largest, our female is getting close to about that. Uh, length would be the wolf eel. Um, and then per mass would probably be the sculpins if we look at species in general. We have a lot of sculpin species. A lot of things. But the biggest individual animal per weight is either going to be the cabazon or per length is going to be the wolf eel. And the wolf eel yeah. get up, gets up to, I believe, about eight feet long. 
Um, and yeah. they can, I, I've heard, although I haven't witnessed it, eat up to something like 20 Dungeness crabs in one feeding, although that's not Whoa. every day. Uh, we do witness a large appetite about once a week with our, our wolf eel. She's still growing. Uh, we have had one previous to this, and she would eat two Dungeness crabs per week. Wow. Uh, plus that's shrimp and scallops. a lot of food. It is a lot of food. You know, the octopus, if we had it, would probably be the largest, as we normally house a giant Pacific octopus up to 40 pounds. Yeah, and you just released your octopus a couple we weeks did. ago. We did. And it's always a bittersweet goodbye. Oh, I'm sure. So I didn't mention, uh, a lot of our animals come to us as a uh, bycatch from the local fishing, shrimping, crab industry. Um, so the, the fishermen go out and they go to catch something specific and then um, accidentally something else gets caught, uh, and which is a normal part of, of fishing. Um, and then if some of those animals may or may not make it, if they're bred up from 400 feet, it would be very difficult uh, for those animals to survive. Uh, so we do take in a sampling of that for the public to learn about. So some of these animals are intertidal, some come from 600 feet or more. Wow. Uh, which is really cool that we get a chance to learn about these subtidal animals because other, other than diving, there's no other way yeah, to see them. Yeah, you can't really experience them. Um, so great. So the, the wolf feels just hanging out there. Hoping for another nibble. Yeah, waiting, waiting for another juicy morsel. I don't think they're gonna get him. The perch are coming first. Oh no, here we go. Hi friend. You gotta be brave. Seize your moment. She's like, oh yeah, I want the big crab. Give me something good. Oh, you want to get more Oh yeah. Look at you. Another eel-like fish. It's got these great uh, frills along their whole body, along the top front part of their dorsal fin. So great. Here's a kelp green thing, one of my personal favorite fish. They get beautiful colors, and they just have such a cool, uh, cool face pointed. Oh, look at you. Oh, and there's our sail fin sculpin down there again. All right. Green thing. Oh, painted greening, you're right. Painted greening there, yeah. And then lots of white spot uh, greenlings in here as well. Oh, and that sailfin is just my absolute favorite. They're just the coolest fish. <laughs> padded or prickly? Padded or prickly? So many different species of sculpins. Yeah, I can this safely say prickly. sculpin. <laughs> sculpin, definitely a sculpin. Definitely sculpin. No swim bladder, looks like a tadpole. Big pectoral fins, eyes on the top, sculpin. And a, and a very big, un on a picky mouth yes. just about willing to swallow anything if it needs a full tummy especially looking grumpy too they have great cool personalities oh yeah look at you guys so cool <laughs> All right. Well, unless there's any more questions, I think we'll kind of get ready to wrap things up here. Should we look at the basket star? Before yes. Oh, off? yeah. Let's definitely do that. You guys are going to lose your mind about this. Because um, this is like a creature like nothing else. Uh, you, you've never seen anything like it. It's amazing. So there's sea stars and then there's brittle stars. Yeah. And so not a true sea star, however. Um, you can definitely see the resemblance. Yeah, you can see that central oral disc is, uh, is nice and round. Um, and what makes this species really interesting is they are our plankton catcher. So rather than grabbing on things like clams or barnacles or mussels, things that don't move, this one's adapted to capture things that do move. Sorry, and I'm fogging up the glass here. Um, so she's got a nice, very stinky mixture of some shrimp in here. And this amazing creature can very carefully unfurl its many many branched arms to be able to capture shrimp so crazy the other animals don't seem to mind that we have to a little <laughs> overfeed this tank yeah right so from above you can see the special treatment that these animals have to get. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the, the hard parts about captivity is you gotta meet the needs of the creatures. And so for this basket star, that means lots of plankton, lots of tasty things. You've never seen a sea star move so fast. So crazy. Of all the animals I wish I could grow in a garden. Oh yeah. 
and they're they're just beautiful and they'll coil up totally completely uh, when they're not feeding to conserve energy they're not super mobile they just sort of sit there <laughs> Thanksgiving feast too. I don't think he's mad about that or she's mad about that. The most beautiful thing to see is a field of these in the wild along a nice rock wall where lots of plankton flows by uh, and having a uh, hundred of these uncurl all in front of you feeding is just oh, amazing. something else. I love our tiny little soft corals down here. Our little, um, uh, John is asking, how do you know how much food to give your animals? Oh, oh, that's a great question. So we <laughs> offer food. It's about every other day for the larger animals and every day for the smaller animals. Um, after 10 years of working with, uh, with most of the same species, you kind of start to see the, the behaviors of begging or wanting. Um, and the squeaky wheel um, gets the grease <laughs> first, and then you start to see the, I didn't get food yesterday, please feed me, and then they get special. Uh, special treats or special um, uh, special feeding schedule, um, but for the most part, if you're offering a wide range of foods, um, you know every other day, most animals are getting what they need, and it's not about what they want. Just like a dog, a lot of fish <laughs> will, will eat until they can't possibly fit anymore. Let's try to so see if I can see the basket stir from this side. Of food is really what's key is making sure that they get what their bodies need. Oh, it's so good, and they're spoiled. Yeah, you. They I, can tell that these these animals are not suffering. Look at the restaurant quality food they're getting. I'm also curious, what species of abalone do you have in this? Oh yeah. That's a good question. So these are That's pintail cool abalone. These are oh my gosh. endangered. Um, and they came from the Puget Sound Restoration Fund. I'm gonna throw out a plug for them. So they actually breed these and then uh, send them back out to the wild to rehabilitate uh, and, and start the, the species back up out here in the Puget Sound. So they've been successful. They're seeing um, more babies uh, where, where they're putting them out, where they're putting um, breeding mature um, adult abalone, uh, which is just fantastic to hear. So people at some point didn't realize um, that eating them and taking them for the beauty of their shells was gonna put such a damper on the numbers um, and they were more or less uh, non-existent in Puget Sound anymore and, and now they're they're bouncing back. They're nowhere near a point where we can fish for them like they are now in California with the red uh, abalone, but uh, we're, we're working red on something. Yeah. <laughs> the Grand Sculpin. The yeah. cutest <laughs> Oh my <laughs> gosh. So the Grand Sculpin, if anyone can, wanna, I don't know if we can see on the them. Of the grunt. Oh, um, they're my favorite for their camouflage. That's Sorry, the glare is just awful. Um, this, maybe we can see him from above, Absolutely. is the coolest little fish. Um, they are perfectly adapted to live in giant barnacle shells. And so when the giant barnacle dies, they leave behind um, this shell that is the perfect size for this little animal. And their nose is very pointed and looks like the closed portion of the barnacle. And then their tail fins and pectoral fins have orange rays on them that helps to um, make them look like the feeding tentacles or the feeding legs of the barnacle. And so no matter which way they're facing inside that giant barnacle shell, they're camouflaged. Um, and they get the name grunt sculpin uh, because they can make noise. We don't typically think of fish as making noise, but grunt sculpins definitely do and they do grunt kind of loudly and they're so cute i grunt with excitement when i see them <laughs> do you do they answer you back stina <laughs> oh yes They don't make the noise, but they're also not very good swimmers, and they're very easy to anthropomorphize as well. <laughs> little gumdrops, right? They're so yeah. cute. I'm also loving your little year young rockfish. So yeah. These are we do a monthly scuba uh, community science survey looking for these little guys out in the Puget Sound. And, um, they're so nice to see a few of them. Yeah, Healthy little ones. Rockfish are one of those few species that live a very long time, with I think 120 to 150 being mm -hmm. the longest lived species. Um, there's so many different kinds, and a lot of them live only 50 to 75 years. But uh, for that reason, um, they a lot of them have been fished out and are now protected because they don't reach maturity until they're about the size that a lot of people think they fit on a plate. So they're not able to reproduce before we're able to catch them. Um, this, so is a, this is a lesser known species, and they don't get quite as big as some of the larger uh, like black rockfish. Here's another long eel-like fish. This is a snake prickleback. The 
the silver line. Yeah. yeah. We also have um, uh, the high cox combs in here. We have oh, a few yeah. saddleback and crescent gunnels. Lots of lots of eel-like creatures in the absence of true eels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have the scallops with their little eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah, can, we, can we see any Yay. scallop eyeballs? I saw this some earlier. Oh, here's one. So scallops can actually see. They have little tiny dots all along their mantle. So good. All right, I think we better wrap things up. So we could geek out here for hours. We have uh, geeked out here for hours, but uh, if you're ever up in Bellingham, once things uh, get back to normal, definitely come <laughs> take, a, take a visit, um, plan some time, and, and plan for like hours of time here. There's all kinds of signage, um, beautiful information presented in a way that's really, really awesome. You can come see these creatures in person. You can feed the shark. Uh, <laughs> or there's even uh, a great touch tank here full of all kinds of different amazing invertebrates uh, that you can get to know on a little more personal level. Um, so when things are back open again, we would highly recommend a visit to the Marine Life Center here in Bellingham. And we are free and we do uh, offer classes. So all you gotta do is shoot us an email, inquire about uh, your group size and what you wanna learn. And we also give a lot of intertidal and it's a gorgeous place to be uh, it's just a really really awesome uh, awesome location I'm super glad that we were able to meet and come up here so thank you Casey for having us and uh, giving us a tour of all your friends here Absolutely. we are thrilled to meet them um, as always, we want to recommend that you share this video to your friends if you can. Um, we, we always appreciate all the, all the love that we can get on our social media accounts. You can always subscribe and follow on our YouTube channel. Um, we, that way you get notified whenever we've got something new and exciting. And then of course, if you want to donate to us or if you'd like to support Harbor Wild Watch through a, a membership to our steward club, we have information about that on our website, harborwildwatch.org. What am I forgetting, girls? Learn, have fun. Yeah, learn, have fun. Anything Thanks else? <laughs> Final okay. words. Oh, yeah. Mask, Mask up. up. Six feet, social distancing. <laughs> Let's everybody uh, get on top of this so we can get over it and hit the beach. Yeah, so we can open, right? All right. Stay one sea lion away from each other. Yeah, one, <laughs> one sea lion's distance. Perfect. You're an excellent mask model, Stina. That's a good <laughs>